Good morning, everybody. And good morning, Josh. Good You're morning. Here. We're together again. It's been a, it's a, this is our, our one year anniversary, I think. One year anniversary. And we seem to get gather, together on National Family Caregiver Month. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a really special time. Um, you know, I think for everyone dealing with a really tough health journey, um, especially in the dementia world. Um, and for me too, um, and, you know, I've had a caregiver experience both with my sister and with my father now. So your sister, so you've been a family caregiver, mm -hmm. um, on that side of the street for a sister mm -hmm. who dementia, not dementia. No, um, you know, my sister was diagnosed with ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a different kind of neurodegenerative mm -hmm. disease um, that leads to progressive muscle loss. Yeah. And recently we've learned more about ALS and that some people with ALS, in fact, do develop dementia and some people don't. Um, and so, but then you're a caregiver also for your dad. And yeah, I mean, not, um, you know, like a lot of caregiving, it's um, really a team effort. Um, I don't actually live with my dad. Uh, but when I go home, you know, there's a lot involved. So my dad has developed a mild to moderate form of dementia, not otherwise specified, unclear what type. He's 92 years old. Uh, wow. And so, yeah, but when, when I go home, there's a lot involved in um, making sure he's still living his best life. Yeah. Wow, Josh. So, okay. So I'll be honest, if my mom was still alive, yeah, she'd be at that age, but you don't look as old as I do. So you must have been a late life child. <laughs> you you did some quick math there. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my dad had me at the age of 52. Wow. Okay. Well, now there's a difference for you. Yeah. yeah. So we have some similarities, but we have some differences in how life has happened. I actually had a younger sister when I was a kid and she was 10 years younger and she developed a brain tumor at age three that was situated in such a way as they could not do surgery on it back in that time. And so they radiated. And when they mm -hmm. radiated, they thought within three years she'd be gone, um, but they were quite wrong. Um, and they radiated and unfortunately they hit the pituitary pretty strongly. Mm. So it impacted her physiological growth as well as her cognitive shifting. So she didn't progress significantly past three years old, um, oh, wow. although her body grew and it grew out more than up. And so we we learned to cope and adapt um, to having a younger. I was the older sister, but I was actually sort of a parent in some ways. And then my grandfather moved in. So a different generational. So I, too, have been a family caregiver, but. I was a lot younger when I did my immediate family caregiving until later on when I got to care for my mom during her um, brain metastases due to lung cancer, but she was already starting to show some early signs of an Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, my grandfather was vascular. Um, and then my mother-in-law, um, due to lots of health condition things, started popping in with some cognitive changes. So yeah. Um, so Josh, okay, so we are two different care people. And this month when we talk about care, I talk more about care partnering, becoming a partner in care. And historically, we've always talked about caregiving. Um, and so when you're an introvert versus an extrovert. Introvert. Yeah, help, help me with that, Tipa. And then, you know, and just as a, as a side note, you know, it sounds like you know, our, our experience has really, in both cases, informed what how we spend most of our time. You know, you've mm -hmm. become this amazing yeah. expert on how to approach um, being a care partner in difficult situations mm -hmm. um, based partly on your professional experience and then also on your personal experience. And then for me, it's the same. You know, I was a cardiologist in training um, when my sister was diagnosed. And that led um, to this question of, you know, what happens to people when they're at home alone trying to figure out their healthcare condition? Um, where do you turn? You know, there's Google, WebMD, you know, and then these places where like TikTok and Instagram, where there's some good content like yours, but there's also a lot of pollution and misinformation. And so and, now and actually like ugly information. 
I mean, things uh, that in my mind should not be actually out there because they're they're mean and they're not helpful and they're ranting and they're raving and it's just not serving. It's not serving the relationship. And it doesn't actually serve caregivers or care partners either in no. my in my estimation. And it's just really misinformation. Yeah. And as a physician, I had nowhere to really send my patients that I felt like I could I could trust. And so that's why, um, you know, I joined this incredible group of engineers, designers, and um, other uh, medical professionals to build this thing called Rune, um, where I'm the chief medical platform officer, which is your trusted guide, safe space to find answers to, uh, to questions. You know, we did it, for, um, you know, in ALS, glioblastoma, dementia. Yeah. And, and it, now- it, it, I mean, and it's meant to operate on a, I, so you can just like, I need help. Here's what I need. Ah, help me. And um, things come up that you can take a look at and explore. And, and you've been an incredible part of that, Tipa. Um, you know, uh, from almost the beginning when we started thinking about maybe we should do this for people um, living with dementia or people going through dementia with a family member or, or a loved one. Um, and so, so pause just a second. So I've got to say, Josh, of all the topics you could have picked, glioblastoma and ALS, I mean, those are highly specific and, and very manageable bite. I mean, yeah, they're, they have a lot to them and there's a lot about them, but you can hold them in one hand and go, okay, so this is the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. This is everybody sort of more or less is going to fit within this realm, maybe off a little bit, but you're there. Then you decide for your other condition, let's pick dementia because like it's going to be easy to wrap your head around and it's like what i mean so seriously what possessed you guys to think dementia as your third third category what got you there well i mean it's just the need that's out there Uh, it's um uh. it's an incredibly difficult diagnosis to deal with um there are so many questions that are unanswered by the healthcare system. Your doctor can't even answer for you. How do I deal with this? How do I live with this? Um, and then, you know, there was also our personal connections. You know, our, our yeah. chief technology officer, his father is suffering from dementia. Wow. You know, my family member, there's the ALS connection to dementia. So it just made kind of logical um, sense for us. Sort of, so I, but, but there was a lot not logical about it. Let's just be honest. There's a lot <laughs> that... Um, there would have been easier conditions to pick, but in fact, what you recognize is the same thing I notice is there's a void. I mean, there's a large void of skilled mm-hmm. providers being able to get to the people who need the information when they need it. And I think that's the critical piece. Need it when I need it. And I want it when I want it. I mean, I don't have like an hour and a half to go research something on. I need a quick, like this is what's happening. How can I, how can I pause and do something different? Cause I'm not liking what's happening. I don't know what to do here. What is going on? I mean, that kind of need for speed, but need for knowledge and skill speed. I mean, it's not just throw everything at me here, read this paper. I mean. And, and, you know, I mean, I think everyone in the world would wish that they could have a TIPA in their pocket to oh. turn to at any kind of difficult moment. And that's what we wanted to, you know, build here was like having a TIPA in your pocket, having a Harvard n- neurologist in your pocket all in one. And so, you know, I think you've answered uh, several hundred questions um, on Rune. And these are the kinds of questions that everyone wishes they could they could ask you. Because a lot of people, if they could come to you, would be asking the same questions. <laughs> You're, that's not, that's not untrue. That is actually fairly true. Um, and usually it all starts with, I have a quick question. <laughs> it's just like, a quick well, some, some people say, you know, I just, I could use your help here. I mean, which is a really good positive action start is like, you could use my help. Okay. Tell me more um, kind of thing. Yeah. And so, and so leading into that, I mean, there's this really interesting question. I, I don't know if you've done this one on Rune yet. And so I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. Okay. Um, uh, what is the difference between extroverted and introverted caregiving? Ah, so we were talking about introvert sort of people who want to be in control and they, they really like to think inside themselves and they need quieted space to do it. And then when they come out, it's sort of like, aha, 
okay, this is what I want to try versus people who like really extroverts who really want to. So Josh, I have a thought, Matthew. Ooh. So I was wondering if, um, what do you think about, I mean, people who really like to engage and talk through things and think through things and group think and sort of like, well, so, so I really get my energy, not by being in control, but by being connected. And so mm. getting connected is super important. So if I, if I give you those two examples, what does it mean then as a carer, a caregiver, what might make that challenging if I was caring for someone living with dementia and I was an introvert, a really strong introverted carer, what would potentially happen between my partner, my person and I? Because in that point, I'm not really partnering. I'm wanting what I want. Yeah, what do you think me. might happen? Uh, well, I, I imagine for me, and it's funny, I feel like I have elements of both. In, mm -hmm. in my in my personality but for me in that in that area part of my brain where I want to control and to um and to just handle things and you know this type a I imagine it could lead to a sense of a burnout maybe mm. burnout is one option so is this clashing Josh Josh no hang on now I'm gonna put your pants on first uh uh uh, -uh. what do you do with your ass no 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 hang on we're going to do the pants so you can stand up. Don't, Josh, look at me. I'm having flashbacks to conversations with my own dad. I mean, in that desire to be helpful, but in my way. Um, and without realizing it, creating a barrier between the two of us. And mm. instead, learning that, oh, hey, Josh, pants first or shirt first? Yeah. And it's a controlled option. Now, on the other hand, if you're a real strong extrovert, Josh, so we're going to get dressed. Now, would you rather put your sh pants on first or your shirts? Because I don't care which one we do. Which would you rather do first? Oh, you know what? How about if we go get, would you like something to drink before we go? Mm. Oh, you know what? I'm going to call Mary, have her come over mm. with you in your underwear. How's that sound? <laughs> Not good. So, but I just thought maybe she could be helpful because... <laughs> It's like, yeah. And I'm being sort of really extreme in both cases, except sometimes when you're in that role, not getting what you need, you start getting more and more extreme. And then, as you said, burnout, either side can burn out because if I don't get the support I'm looking for as a extrovert, it starts to feel really lonely and empty. And I, I'm just, I'm run down. On the other hand, as an introvert, if I'm not getting the control over the system, and when I have people and they don't do it the way I like them to do it, and I can get isolated and also not do terrific uh, as a care person. T for me. So, Tiba, are you saying this is like a, I you know, to use a very like overused trope, but um, this is like a yin and the yang moment. It's like yeah. it, not one is better than the other. Yeah. It's just if I'm more of an introvert, how can I start to explore the extrovert potential for me to get some support in that I don't have to control as much. And the, the way I did it really simply was this or that, because I can handle this or that because I've limited the options. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel good. You might feel better about having it a this or a that. And when I offer to have someone else come in, would you rather spend time with Josh or would you rather do some kitchen work? Cause I could use both. It, are you saying there's also a part of this that's like maybe someone who's extroverted? And in that way, I do like talking to people in my community, being like, what would you do here? What should we do? Is there an element where that becomes also too much, where you're not like, how does that how does that look? Yeah. So if I'm needing a lot of input and yet I I, I I'm having so much trouble because there's not a straight answer. And so I'm exploring all these options and the person I'm trying to care for or care with is like, I don't know what you want me to do. And it's like, well, hang on a second. Let me ask, let me see what we should do. So what would you like to do? And it's like, um, Josh, would you rather do this or that mm -hmm. is a much more helpful thing. But as an extrovert, I'm trying so hard to connect that I mm -hmm. don't realize all these connections are actually not getting me anywhere. I mean, I'm going to all these different sources. I'm I'm having all these interactions, and yet I I'm listening to everybody. 
I don't know what to do. And I feel immobilized because they're different opinions and I don't know, I don't know what to do with this. And so we do nothing. Um, and it sits for a long time and it starts to get faster and it gets more and more. And then I'm, I'm like, I don't know what to do. Hmm. And, and Tipa, what about the opposite end of the spectrum? What about, let's say a care partner who feels very alone uh, and wants to bring in family members. What's your best advice for someone who's facing that kind of situation? Yeah. Well, for me, it's prepare a little bit. What would you really like some help with? And then on the other hand, who do you got that offers what kind of possible support? Who's got some strengths in what? And then see how these match up or they don't. And if they don't, it may truly be time to look outside the traditional family and start mm. thinking about a found family, a made family, a family that helps support you where you need your support. So, I mean, I'm a strong believer in I'll seek, but then if I don't find in that location, I'm going to go seek somewhere else. I'm not going to keep going back where I didn't find what I was looking for because it tends to just aggravate everybody involved. Mm. But sometimes when I say I could use some help and they say, well, what do you need? And I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't processed that ahead of time. Well, I need help. Yeah. And so people often are more able to go accurately. I can, I can't, I might, I might not. If I set it up so there's structure to it. And that can be really challenging for folks sometimes. Uh, tell me if this is a, a wrong analogy. I'm almost thinking of, it's like, a, it's almost like a wedding registry. It's mm -hmm. like, if you tell people, um, just buy me gifts um, for the wedding, people are going to feel lost. They're not going to know what to do. They're going to debate it. They're going to spend weeks perseverating. Do I do this? Do I do that? And if you give them just a list here, like, here are the things I need, you know, here are the things I want. It becomes much easier. You get the things you want. You don't get that gift of, you know, a new pot when you already had five pots. Yeah. Uh, and the trick, here's the tricky part is taking and creating that space for me to do that. Mm -hmm. And that may mean I have to make one ask to get the support I need to find the space and time I need. And after that, then, and if I'm an introvert, guess what I need to go and do over here. If I'm an extrovert, I need that coffee time where we write everything down that we're talking about during that coffee break. Mm -hmm. And I actually need to talk about it with somebody and chat it through to see what makes sense for me to ask for. Whereas the introvert wants to go off and go do it. Now, mm. I would say in both cases, it'd be a good idea to check with somebody who's sort of aware of what what will be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Not just, I want ice cream. And it's like, good to know. How much would you like? A lot. Okay, well, what else do you have in mind? Just ice cream right now. And it's like, how about a spoon? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoon. How about a bowl? Oh, bowl would be good. How about how about freezer space? Oh yeah, I guess I need freezer space. And it's like that ability. You may think this is what I need, and then to be able to take that step back and realize, oh well, actually, I need other things around even that thing because this caring thing is really complicated. I mean, sort of in in honor of you know National Family Caregiver Month. You know, it sounds like, and and I mean, I certainly know this to be true. You think coming into being a care partner, being a caregiver, um, whatever's the right term for you, um, you think, oh, oh, I can just do this. This is a part of being human. This is a something that I should be good at. And actually, being a a care partner is an entirely new skill in many cases. It's not yeah. something that, you know, as a physician, as a cardiologist, you know, I think, oh, I can be a care partner, but actually this is entirely different than being a physician. This is entirely different than your uh, job out in the, the world where you um, have spent, you know, maybe 10, 20 years building up skills. And this is an entirely new set of skills. Yeah, I mean, what's really fascinating to me is how recently, and I'm, I'm gonna do a different comparison, how many cases of postpartum depression we are now recognizing that's what's going on. And it's not just females that experience it. It's, it's males and spouses as well, or male partners who are involved in it, because all of a sudden we presented with this challenge that's going to take up an incredible amount of time, brain space, new skill development, and the presumption that everything's going to be super. And, you know, it, it's not. 
And, you know, often I think walking in, I can, I mean, I'm a physician, I'm a this, I'm an OT, of course I'll be able to handle this. And it's like, huh. well, in this situation, I'm not feeling the handle so much. It feels more like, ooh, the world is going dark, but I know there are things I can choose to do, but it means, in fact, I had to step out of the picture for a minute to go do it. And, and I that would means ouch. And and using your analogy, I mean, I would argue as much as the difficulty of raising a child is underappreciated, yeah. I would say it's oh. probably more recognized that this is going yeah. to be a new life phase that requires massive changes yeah. compared to um, you know, you prepped, uh, you prepped nine dimension. months. <laughs> you were yeah, you've been working on this. Yeah. I mean, many people buy books that they read, you know, in the nine months. And, and there have been chemical no, no, changes in your body over nine months, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I agree no with nine you month warning. There's yeah. no like clear no. signal, uh, pee on a stick, nine month Here warning. It's coming. But, yeah. Here's this thing that's massive changes coming now. And so in, in honor also of this, you know, um, you know, you know, one of the things we want to do at Rune is provide people that guide in their hand, yeah. um, that place where you can go. I'm a new care partner, new caregiver, I have questions coming up on the fly and I want to go here. And so I wanted to maybe at, throw out a few of the top questions, what we're seeing from care partners and okay. just kind of here on this live, if you don't mm -hmm. mind, off, yeah, off yeah. go for it, um, ask you some of the questions that are coming in. So I have like a, a couple here listed. So interesting situation. We had a, a care partner ask, how do I deal with feelings of resentment towards mm -hmm. a, a family member? who isn't helping out as much as much as I wish they would. Well, are you an introvert or an extrovert? If you're an introvert, think about journaling it out and sort of getting it all out of your system. Like write out, what is it that you're really resenting? What are you really feeling unfair about? And what it is you would really like to see and then work on letting it go. Because if it's not happening, it's not happening. So where else or who else or how else, what are you going to change? Because if you want a different outcome, something's got to change, but it's got to be you that does the change. You can't want somebody else to change and have it happen. You've got to decide to make a change. And so that's tricky. If you're more of an extrovert, here's the tricky part. Don't go bitch about the other person. But really consider, ask if you have anybody in your world who'd be really willing to do some work with you to look at what might be behind some of these shifts and changes and what you're seeking and what's not happening. And so maybe you could hear it differently if you didn't have an old relationship that might be getting in the way of the new ask and see, well, what other options are there? If this isn't seem to be working, are you just mostly frustrated and angry? And it's fair to be frustrated and angry when you've been left with the decision to pick up the pieces because Nobody else is picking them up and you feel responsible. It's hard sometimes not to be resentful that they get to go do and they have this. And, and it's like, well, let it out because I hear you. But at the same time, you made a choice and it feels like it wasn't, but it actually is. Um, so maybe it's time to talk about that choice and what all you've picked up and whether or not it feels like it's a reasonable thing to do for you or it's starting to be unreasonable. And really mm. look in the mirror at yourself and decide, am I really hating all this? What do I still like about the person in this situation? And what am I feeling overwhelmed by? And get some support. Uh, you know, a common theme now, you know, Tipa, we spent many hours together talking through these questions. And it yeah. seems like a, a common theme is um, pause mm -hmm. and, a, and a moment of introspection. When you're dealing with these really tough questions, it's like, stop, take a deep breath and try and take stock of what's going on around you, what's driving these frustrations. And well, then and what's still working? What yeah. is working? I mean, what's working well? What are you doing well at? Because it's easy to get sucked into the void of, you know, man, if I had, if I did, yeah. Um, another question that comes up all the time on our own. Um, you've, and I've definitely seen this in my own life. There are some people who, um, go through being a caregiver and they forget about themselves. Mm. How, oh. how can someone in that, in that light, remember to pause and, uh, and uh, have moments of self-care yeah. um, without feeling like they're doing a bad job? Yeah. So 
here's my startup rule. It's like, how many fingers have I got there? Gosh. Hmm. Five. Five. So how about we go on your clock here, your your clock, and I want you to pick five times a day hmm. that you're going to give yourself five minutes to pause. When the alarm goes off, you're going to pause. You're going to a couple times. You're going to find that place where you can go, okay, so hmm. what am I liking? What am I wanting? And what do I feel like I need? What do I need for me? Is it physical something? Is it a cognitive something? Is it an emotional something? Is it a spiritual something? Where am I feeling this, this space that I don't have? And now I've got three minutes. Let's see. What could I do for myself in that two minutes, two of the three, that set me up to move out of this space? What can I prepare myself and how can I initiate and where or who or when or how am I going to participate in something? And then I'm going to jot a note on my way out or make a note on the way out, put it on the whiteboard and then come back to it at the end of the day. The last pause is to look over the day and think, okay, what have I figured out that I'm missing? What have I figured out that I feel good about? What am I figuring out? And where and what could I do differently come tomorrow? Mm, I love that, Tipa. The, you know, using the technology tools around you to um, to help setting a physical setting an alarm five times a day, five minutes. It's not that hard. Twenty five minutes total. And yeah. if what you're doing is so so invested in the world around you and in others, um, giving yourself twenty five minutes. Oh man. That's so essential because mm. maybe what you really can do is change the world once you change those five minutes. Yeah. Um, Tipa, this last question really hits home for me. Uh, I'll give you a brief anecdote. Um, before my dad developed dementia, um, as a cardiologist, there was a moment where um, he had a blocked artery mm. in his heart. And we were trying to make the decision about whether or not to put in a stent and open mm -hmm. up that blocked artery. And in the world of cardiology, there's some um, controversy about whether that is always the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it ultimately fell onto me. It was my call. Do we put in a stent um, as you know his son and the physician and open up this artery or do we not? And ultimately, we decided not to put in the stent. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of follow-up things that happened since then. And I often still to this day will come mm -hmm. to moments where I think about that decision. Mm -hmm. And I think about, did we do the right thing or did we not? I have also had moments that are more banal, like where um, it seemed like he was worn out. There's a big family event. And I decided, you know what? Um, this is too much. We're going to take him home. And I have felt guilt about that or ah. second guess myself. Yeah. So as a care partner, you're often forced with making all these sometimes big and sometimes mm -hmm. little decisions. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of moments and opportunities to second guess. Yeah. What what can someone do as a care partner to feel better about the decisions they make yeah. for dementia? This is something we see hot top hot topic on around. Hot topic, yeah. People are really fearful of making the wrong decisions that leads to this horrible, horrible path. And what, what I'd say is, wow. So right after, you know, deciding not to do the surgery, was there a dramatic change for the worse for your dad? No, not necessarily. It was more yeah. subtle. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, hmm. so in making that choice, it felt like you were making the choice. I'm really curious, how much were you really thinking about your dad's life and what it might look like this way and what it might look like that way? How much would you say you were really thinking about for your dad, what he would really want? You know, it's funny. I wasn't really thinking about what my dad would want in that moment. I was thinking about what is the medically best thing. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, yeah. you know, what, what is going to help him live the longest? What is mm -hmm. going to lead to these outcomes? Mm -hmm. And thinking back on that moment, I don't remember taking the perspective of like, what would my dad want? 
Yeah. So if I ask you that question, when you think about that, what do you think your dad, you know, think about that surgical procedure? I mean, because it's not a minor little procedure. It's, it's sort of a big deal and things can happen. What do you think your dad has enjoyed since that moment? Well, I mean, um, I think he's had a lot of good years since that moment. Oh, yeah. so that choice led to a lot of good years. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get that pack off your back and realize, wow, good job. Because what happened ended up being what it is. And moving that forward, it's like, it's so hard as a care person to think, boy, if I make the wrong decisions, like we make decisions all the time. You know, I'm going to put my shoes on while I'm standing on one leg. I'm going to put my shoes on sitting down. Each one of those will have a road that you travel. I mean, some of them might be dramatic changes and some of them might be, eh, it didn't make any difference really, did it? Oh, I don't know. But I know tomorrow's maybe there, but what I have right now is what I have right now. So when you look at where you are right now, what do you see as possibilities versus looking behind and what do you view as regrets? Because- oh, man, Pippa. I didn't know this morning was going to turn into like a <laughs> therapy session for me, I'm like on the verge of tears. Um, oh, it's hard to think. It's hard to think. I was just thinking that entire thing about the good moments we've had together over the last years. Isn't that cool? Because yeah. now suddenly I got you to let go of that, that decision was just, it was a momentary. I mean, you got there and you didn't even go there the way other people might go there. You know how we get to places. It's beyond me. But when I'm there. I can see what the possibilities are. And I can look back and reflect on, wow, there've been some good moments since that decision. And you know what? There will be good moments ahead and there'll be rough moments ahead, but life will keep going until we're done. And then we can reflect on some of those special moments we had, or we can focus on all the regrets. And frankly, I need to find a space where I can go on to my next day. Mm. I love that, Tipa. Um you know, as we wrap up here, um, I'm curious, a uh, couple last questions. Um, do you have Here's any- Here's a question, Josh. Let me give you a question. Oh, please. How much do the people out there think this this app is probably costs a month? Because there are a lot of apps out there. How huh. much do you think this one is going to cost you a month to get this kind of expertise? Because, I mean, they have a host of, of experts on here. This is like, I mean, if they they have people living with conditions, they have, you know, the top notch researchers, they have top notch neuroscientists, they have pharmacists, they have nurses, they have, they have psychologists, they have psychiatrists. I mean, they have a top notch crew and it's not all people have the same opinions or have the same ideas, but we, we base it on what our background, our knowledge, our expertise is, but it doesn't mean you always find exactly the same answer from five people. It'll give you food for thought, though, and maybe you'll find your space. So how much does this kind of program cost, Josh, for people Thank to you. use it? Thank you for bringing that up, Deepa. Sometimes I feel a little bit shy talking about, mm. you know, Rune and um, and what we've done. But the, the app is, you know, a lot of people, the first question they ask is, how much does this cost? Am I going to have to pay money? And one of the most important things for us and our entire team as we develop this is that you know, people around the world should be able to access this information. People, you know, should have access to you. You know, your time is incredibly limited. You can't talk to everyone in the world who needs you. And people should have that access to the best neurologist, um, the best, you know, person to help them navigate these really difficult moments. And um, the app is free. Um, and oh, so say that again. the app is free. The app is free for people who are, can ask these questions. You can create your profile. You can get more and more detailed in what you like. Um, you can ask questions back and they will do their very best to try to get those questions responded to. And you, when you ask questions, it'll give you some possibilities of what about this or you want to look at this. So and now I just wanted to get that out there because I think you didn't ever say that. And I think it's an important thing to say is... Um, this is a contribution to making a difference in the world. Um, this is one of those legacy things that, yeah, I mean, there's there's behind this. I mean, there, you got to fund stuff. I mean, we all know that, but it's not on the backs of people who are going to look for the information. No, and um, and really, like our 
you know, my team's part in this is just providing the the conduit, the the thing on your phone, the website that you can go to. Um, and the people who really built it are all the experts on the platform like yourself. That's that is what Rune is. It's it's Keepa, it's Andrew Budson, it's Feyron apps, all these incredible experts who have answered sometimes hundreds of questions on there. And then and you know, we try and use technology to make it even easier. So if you go at the top of the app now, there's like this this bar. And you one of the things we realize is not everyone asks their questions in the same way. Um, so we have all these questions that are phrased in a certain way. But if you go in the top of your home screen, there's this bar where it says ask any question. And you can literally type in any question. And it search, searches just the thousands of uh, expert um, answers and summarizes an answer to your specific phrasing um, and then cites the experts and their videos that you can watch if you want to. So it's pretty, it is, it's cool. Um, it and is cool. Um, it's a little resource in your pocket for, for whatever you're going through. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'm, I'm proud to have, made a you know a small contribution to this with with people like you Tipa. glad to be part of what we hope will make a difference in people's lives when they're in that moment and they're stuck and they could use some support um because there isn't a family member because they don't have a friend because they're it's middle of the night because it's the 20th time because i'm about to lose it you know like how can i get started somewhere because you know, going to the yard ER doesn't necessarily seem like we've done that. And it didn't go anywhere that I needed it to go. Are there other options? And then when I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about having a heart attack. I'm talking about, it's just like, I don't know what to do. She's seeing things and it's like, ah, well, let's go check that out. Why don't we? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Tipa. Um, I feel like you've uh, already answered this in some ways, but as we, as we wrap things up, do you have any words of wisdom for caregivers um, who sometimes forget what an incredible job they're doing? Um, I would say, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, um, find a friend, um, find several if you're an extrovert, but really in those moments, share two things that are going well and one you wish was different, but then right, how are you doing? How are you doing? And if you have a friend, have the friend use a little support and reflection and celebrate together. I mean, we need to celebrate the possibilities for ourselves um, because all too often, there's not a lot of folks around that are going to say, wow, you did this amazing job. However, if you are around, look at the person and say, first of all, so how are you doing, doing the caring? Here, 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 or here. And then when they say down here, don't say, oh, you're great. Say, ooh, that doesn't sound good. But tell me two things that are, aren't as horrible as they might be that you're making work because I know you're making them work. And we got to start with where you are, not where I'd like you to be. And Tipa, that reminds me, um, I was at a dinner with uh, some friends recently and someone posed the question at the end of the dinner, what's something that you're proud of that you mm -hmm. don't often talk about or don't put on your resume? And I talked about, when I go home and help care for my dad, mm -hmm. oh God, I'm going to tear up again. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really proud of the care that I give him. I think I do a good job when I'm home. I help change him. I help him get dressed and clean him up. And I'm always really proud of, you know, taking him out after, after helping him get ready, putting him in a nice outfit. It always makes me kind of proud. Yeah. And it wasn't that decision you made not to do that stint. Mm -hmm. It's living in the moment with him and recognizing, wow, this relationship matters. And yeah. I'm choosing to make it matter. Thank you, Tipa. Thank you for being a part of Rune. Um, I hope mm -hmm. it provides uh, some help to people out there if they're, you know, like you said, up in the middle of the night and, um, Maybe we'll do this again on our next yes. uh, two-year anniversary. Ta-da! Or maybe before. <laughs> you never know. You never All right, know. everybody. So we hope that sharing the way we did got you thinking about, oh, well, let me go check this out. And we put the link in. And we do encourage you during this month to find the support you need and realize as a family member offering care, 
you deserve care. And not only deserve care, you need it. So don't ignore yourself in this whole mix. Till next time, take care with your care and take care of yourself. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Tipa. Bye, all.